Hello and welcome. Thanks for joining me. I am Natasha and I'm from Telltale Hearts and this is Storytelling Module 2, Bringing Stories to Life in the Home. Thank you so much for joining me and also we are hugely grateful to the Abu Dhabi Early Childhood Authority for making this initiative a reality. So hello, I hope that uh, some of you were with me last week when I was looking at stories and we were looking at establishing a routine or a ritual around starting a story and I wonder if any of you had fun with those during the week or even with your, with your fairies. So this week, what we're going to be focusing on is language and also repetition and how that um, can help children's language acquisition and language development and also gestural language. So we're going to be looking at these things in relation to another story. And this story is a story from West Africa. It's called The Fisherman and the Ring. And we'll be seeing that a little bit later. But before we do, just a quick overview of myself. I'm not gonna dwell on this. If, if you want to know, find out more about me, you can look up Telltale Hearts, which is one of the links at, at the bottom of the handout. But my background is in performance, in all kinds of theatre, from puppetry, storytelling. Um, but I also trained in Eastern theatre styles, things like Kathakali and Beijing Opera. And the, during my training, it was looking at ways of being able to put some of the Eastern styles together with some of the Western forms and put the two things together. And I have specialised um, my entire professional life working with children and in particular, very young children. Um, and I'm also a parent, so I'll be sharing some of my expertise with you. If you have any questions through the session or at the end of the session, please do put them in the chat box or in the Q&A and I will pick those up at the end of the session. Um, and I will be asking you um, a short question in a second and I will also be using the chat box for that if you'd like to interact with some thoughts that you might have. So I thought it'd be interesting to start this session off by just thinking about why are stories important for young children? So what for you is the most important thing about why stories are important for young children? And if you have any particular views or thoughts on that, you can put them in the chat box right now and I shall, I shall pick up some of your responses to that. I've got some of my own thoughts that I'll share with you, but it'd be interesting for me to know what your thoughts are on, um, on why stories are so important for young children. So any thoughts, put them in the chat box. And of course, I'm going to start with language, which is what we're looking at today. Um, because stories help to develop language and they help to expand vocabulary as well, which is so important in those early years. So that's one very key thing. Um, another key thing of why I think children um, stories are important is it builds sequencing. So we can start to see how a story is ordered through a sequence of events. And a particular thing that is really important is recapping, because recap recapping helps children to also sequence those events as they start to build that narrative learning. And another key thing, I'm just seeing if there's any responses in the chat box. Oh, not yet, not yet. Maybe you're holding on to those ideas. But another reason why stories are important is because it helps us to discover meaning. We often share stories as a way of making a point or sharing, sharing a meaning about something. And those meanings might be moral lessons. There might be points that we want to make about sharing and some of those good parenting things that we're trying to encourage our children for. So... That's an, another good point that stories are helpful for those kind of moral lessons and the meaning. I also think it's really important because it helps with a shared experience between yourself and your child um, that you can broker together that shared experience of sharing a story together. Um, 
and discovering it together too. Um, and I, I think for, the, for me, this is one of the most key things really, is it helps to develop empathy and compassion. And that's done through the characters that are part of the story, that there are characters that they can identify with, maybe a character that goes on a bit of a learning journey, but it's also about them being able to put themselves into a different situation, maybe into a different world, into a different context. And that beginning of starting to self-critique and think and the empathy that is developed through that is I think hugely beneficial doesn't come overnight it's part of it is part of the journey um, and as I've said characters that stories are a wonderful way of introducing other characters other cultures other places from different parts of the world as well and in the Middle East you have some of the richest tradition of stories from your oral storytelling tradition so you know the Arabian Nights is um, famous throughout the world and rightly so so you've got fantastic stories and a wealth of cultural traditions to, to share through that and then finally my final thing is it stimulates the imagination um, and I talked a bit about that last week but it really really stimulates their imagination in the whole exchange of what stories can bring to them and that kind of critical thinking which comes from their beginning of self-awareness as it's starting to develop. So this week we are going to be focusing on that language and how you can sort of develop language through storytelling and I've done it by breaking it up into four parts. So the first part is looking at repetition and repetition of certain words and certain phrases repeated in different contexts or in the same context or for dramatic effect helps to reinforce new vocabulary and new language acquisition. Um, also repetition is so wonderful for young children because they love what's familiar to them and it makes their learning safe. So repetition is also brilliant for dramatic effect. So repetition is a key part of it. The second thing is that gestural language. So we can replace a word by using a gesture instead. instead. And in the story last week that I was doing, I used um, that I was going to share stories from all over the and left a space there for them to imagine world. They might have thought of Earth, might have thought of planet, or they might have thought of Abu Dhabi. It doesn't matter, but it's about giving space, giving the gesture and giving the space for them to come up with the word and the space for them to say it. So that's physical gesture. And third thing, encouraging vocal play. So in terms of developing language, part of it is also training our tongues, our lips, our articulators to be able to shape and mould different languages and different sounds within our mouth. That's part of, you know, language acquisition too. And being able to use abstract sounds, playful sounds, like I used for the fairies last week, is about also getting your articulators um, warmed up and, and about children using all their tongue, the shape of their mouth, um, which encourages that it, when they are vocalising and speaking, it'll be easier for you to, to start to understand the words it is that they're making. And I know that I'm sure you understand your children very well, but it is that classic thing of quite often when a child is speaking to another adult, that adult has difficulty sometimes understanding and it's part of developing those articulators in our, in our children. Um, so I would say never underestimate the nonsense sound and the abstract sound and the play sounds that they make as they're playing as well. It's wonderful for also what it's doing with those articulators. And the fourth thing that we're going to focus on today is that role play opportunity. So it's the opportunity for your children to speak because if they're listening to a story, 
well, when is the chance for them to speak and vocalise? Well, I would argue that, that they can speak all the time, pretty much, um, respond to it. The more they respond and the more they respond vocally, the better, the more engaged they are. That's fantastic. Um, and in particular, this story that you're going to see very shortly, The Fisherman and the Ring, um, there are key kind of role play opportunities that the children are given. And that enables me to be able to interact with them and for them to vocalize with me um, so that they're already part of the story. So just to recap, before we watch the video of today's story, I just want you to focus on those four things. How I use repetition, which words I replace with a gesture, what sound effects I use with nonsense, vocalization, and four, what roles I get the children to play in the story. So those are the four things that I want you to kind of focus on as you're watching this story this time and at the end of the video I will check in with you and see what of the what things you you noticed through the story so like I said these videos were filmed during lockdown so they're a little bit rough around the edges and unfortunately there are no children but you can imagine I think the children's interaction and these stories you can watch again with your children later the link is on the handout so you can go directly to that link and watch the video from the start and later share it with your child afterwards having seen it first for yourself so that it gives you an insight as to how you can get the most out of that experience so without further ado let's watch The Fisherman and the Ring, a story from West Africa. We're ready for our video. Hello again. It's time for another story. Let's find out where this story is from and take a look inside the magic case. Hey, 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 hey. Well, this is a fishing net, which tells me it's a story about fishing. <laughs> Well, here in lockdown, unfortunately, we can't go to the seashore. So we're going to have to see if we can bring the seashore to us. And I wonder if maybe you could help with that. Do you think you could make the sound of the waves for me? Yeah. Oh, yes, I'm starting to hear them. That's great. And do you think you could make the shapes of the waves for me with your hands, maybe like this or maybe with your arms and you could make big waves or giant waves great and if you want you could even make waves with fabric you could use some fabric a little bit like this splish or like this splish so in a moment, if you want, you can pause the video and see if you've got some fabric or you could see if you've got a fish. So maybe have a look and see if you've got a glove and that glove could become your fish or maybe you've got one of those missing socks that's always getting lost in the washing machine and maybe that could become your fish for this story. So if you want to press pause and get those things, then you can join in the story. Welcome back. Before we hear our story, let's see if I can catch your fish. So can you get those fish swimming for me? And let's see if I can catch 
Mm, that stripy fish, or maybe that rainbow fish, or maybe a sparkly fish. Uh oh, no fish today. Well, this story comes from the same place as my bowls. I can't even bring my unicorn down to the seaside today because it's in quarantine. But these bowls I found on a market in West Africa. And in trading for these bowls, I found that the person selling them also traded in stories. And this is the story about a fisherman and the gold ring from West Africa. And this fisherman's name was Adisa. And Adisa wanted more than anything to become a fisherman. So he went to his father and he said, Father, I want to become a fisherman so much. And his father clicked because he didn't want him to become a fisherman. He wanted him to have a job that might earn lots of money. What kind of jobs would you like to have when you're older? Or what would you like to be? Maybe you'd like to be a superhero or perhaps a, a mermaid or a teacher or a doctor or even a vet. Well, Ardisa, he didn't want to be any of those things. He wanted to be a fisherman. And so he went to his father one more time. And if you want, you can say it with me. He said, Father, I want to become a fisherman so much. And his father smiled and he told him to follow his heart and to do whatever made him. So each week, Ardisa would save a little bit of his pocket money so that one day he might save himself enough to buy a... Can you make those waves for me again? That's it. Make those wonderful waves, either with your arms or with that fabric you found. What do you think he was saving for? That's right, a fishing boat. Well, weeks passed, months passed, years passed, until he'd saved up enough to buy that boat. It wasn't the best boat, but it was a little bit smelly and a little bit leaky but Ardisa was proud because he'd saved up hard for it and he set off from the harbour can you make those waves for me again sploosh sploosh and he tried to catch that first fish and he tried to catch that stripy fish and he tried to catch that rainbow fish and he tried to catch Mm, that sparkly fish. But Ardisa's net remained empty. The sun was starting to set and he was about to set sail for shore when out of the corner of his eye, he saw something moving in the water. And quick as a flash, he got his fishing net and heave. Heave! Blue lip! Heave! <sighs> Ardisa realised that the fish was trying to speak to him. <gasps> Set me free, Ardisa, so I can swim with all the other fish in the sea. <sighs> Well, Ardisa, what do you think he should do? Yes, that's right. He decided to take the fish and very, very gently, sploosh, he let him free. He didn't think he'd ever see that fish again, but no sooner had its nose touched the water than sploosh, it bobbed straight back up. But this time, in its mouth, 
was a golden ring. Take hold of the ring, Adisa. <gasps> and all of your wishes will come true. <gasps> Thank you, Sploosh. Adisa took hold of the golden ring and then he wished with all his might. I wish to become a great fisherman so much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, the sea began to swell. Can you make those giant waves for me again? That's right, sploosh, big waves. And the fish started jumping out of the sea and into his net. <gasps> sploosh, gunk, oh, sploosh, gunk, <gasps> sploosh, gunk, sploosh, gunk, oh, sploosh, gunk. Let me see if I can catch your fish. Sploosh, gunk, <gasps> oh, sploosh, sploosh, until his net was so full of fish he could carry it no more. He put it in the back of his boat and he set sail once more for shore. When he got to the shore, he decided that he would go to the fish market. Now, has anyone here ever been to a fish market? Maybe you've seen some fish there. What kinds of fish have you seen? Well, let's see, shall we, what fish Adisa manages to sell. Fresh fish! Fresh fish! Who wants to buy some fresh fish, huh? Would you like to buy a fresh fish? I have for you, oh, a fantastic stripey fish. How many gold coins? <gasps> so many. Great. Here you are. Thank you. And put the gold in here. Thank you. Fresh fish, fresh fish. Three fish for the price of two for you. There we go. Thank you. Fresh fish, fresh fish. Soon Odysseus' net was no longer full of fish. It was full of gold. And he took the gold and gave it to his father as a gift so that his father might be able to build a house and I've heard that the children of the children of the children of the children of Adisa are still living in that house to this very day and that's the end of the fish and the golden ring and if you want to tune in next week, I'll have another story for you. Thank you. Hello, it's me again. I hope you enjoyed that story. And I wonder if you noticed some of those things. If you did, you can put them in the chat box and I shall pick them up. Um, but otherwise, the first one that we were looking at was repetition. What repetitions did you manage to see in that story? There was the repetition of that phrase, <clears throat> I wish to become a fisherman so much, wasn't there? Um, which establishes that character's desire and reinforces it. Um, and we've got the repetition of the fish each time the fisherman tries to catch the fish so it becomes a, a game and when I'm doing that live with with children I actually try and catch the children as as the fish um, and I let them call out different types of fish so I I made those ones up there but I'll often let the children say what kinds of fish they might be. And they might be parrot fish or angel fish, or they might be superhero fish. It depends what kinds of fish they come up with. But then I will repeat those back and I'll use, I'll keep using those fish as, as, part, of, as part of the story. Um, so what other, um, what other aspects we had, um, replacing the word with gesture. So did you see where I, I did that about his um, father told him to follow his? And normally I wouldn't say the word, but because it's 
video and I don't have the children there, I did actually say heart afterwards, but I would encourage them to say the word. And likewise, his father. And sometimes the children will say smiled or sometimes they'll say happy or any number of those things. And there's no right or wrong answer, but they get the idea that his father wants him to be happy and, 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 and pleased. Um, and also at the end, the house where I construct it. And again, that's to encourage them to say whatever kind of house or type of place they might see. It doesn't, to me, it doesn't matter if, if, if they were to say something maybe different, if they were to say a boat, that's, that's fine. It's getting their imagination going and I can see how much they've invested in the story that way. Um, so the third thing, those vocal sound effects. So again, in catching the fish, I made all those strange noises. And in terms of making the waves, creating that soundscape, which is perhaps one of the simplest and easiest ones, ones to do. But it's a great way of getting their buy-in to join in with those gestures and join into it vocally as well. Um, and um, the fourth one is that role play. So like I said before, I'm treating the children as if they are the fish and uh, as if I'm trying to catch them and it becomes a little bit of a game. But also I use them later as market traders and barterers. And quite often they will have a little bit of a barter with me or um, they'll be very clear about what particular fish it might be that they're wanting. Um, and they also can often be very clear about the price that they're prepared to pay for it. Um, so again, it's another great way of bringing them into that dialogue and bringing them into role in a, in a way that they're that's not self-conscious, but it's just bringing them lightly into the story. So those were some of the, the four things um, that I hope you identified in that story. And I hope uh, if you enjoyed it, that you can watch it again with, with your child or with your children. And um, maybe you've got a sock that you could use as, as, as the fish or some fabric that you could have ready there. Um, so, if you do watch the story, which I recommend, obviously, um, then here are a few ways that you can build on that experience afterwards. So if you've got some of that spare fabric, whether it's blue or any other kind of colour, can you put it down on the floor and use it as the sea and then maybe hide some objects underneath it that you can use as, as fish? So they could be, they could be socks or or gloves, or they could be pegs, anything that you think could substitute as a fish. Um, and they can then maybe take um, their fishing net, which could just be a hat, or it could be a bag, and they can go fishing and try and find where you've hidden them underneath the sea. Um, another idea is to play at market traders um, and see if you can ask them what it is that they want to sell. They can set up their own stall and you can barter, whether it's in buttons or whether it's in pretend monopoly money or something of, of that ilk, or even if you want to use stones as part, of the, as, as, as part of that pretend money. But you can barter with them and, and see um, how good they are at selling their wares to you. Um, and then another idea is that you could, you could go up for a row on a boat. If you put two chairs facing each other and maybe sit in between um, and you can go rowing, sail out to sea and see what kind of things you can catch um, and or also just see what kind of different shores it might be that you get washed up on and see what story might emerge if you landed on a, on a different shore that you'd not visited before and what strange creatures might live there. So these are just a few ways that you can build on the story experience afterwards in terms of their play um, to develop even more learning out of, out of the story. So how can these things help with your storytelling and your story reading that you want to share with your children at home? So 
here are some thoughts of how you can put some of this into your story reading or your storytelling for your own children. So first of all, I think, see if you can choose two or three words from your storybook that you're going to share with them. And instead of saying the word, use a gesture in instead. So for example, it might be about how a character is feeling. So you might want to substitute the feeling if the character's feeling scared. <gasps> you might want to substitute that <gasps> for that character. Or it might be that the character's excited. So you might want to substitute a <gasps> gesture for that character. Or it might be that you want to replace an object in that story, like the heart, as I did in mine, or a boat. And the point with these gestures isn't that you have to use the exact gesture, just you find your own gesture that's meaningful to you and that you can do with your child, but that you think suggests a little of what the object is. So pick two or three words and replace them with a gesture that could be an emotional one, or it might be an object that's physicalized like the boat or like the house. Secondly, maybe choose a key phrase from that story. What key phrase can you identify? So in mine, it was, I wish to become a fisherman so much. What key phrase can you find in your story that you can repeat? Doesn't matter if it's repeated in the text in the book, doesn't matter. You can repeat it and you might want to repeat it so that the second time your child says it with you and the third time they say it and you don't say it, or you might want to repeat it to build, um, to build momentum or tension. So it might be that you're repeating something, I don't know what to do, I don't know what to do, I don't know what to do, I don't know what to do. <sighs> yeah, so you're repeating it to build tension to something. So try that repetition. And then the third thing, um, can you create a sound effect as part of your story to help with maybe an action like I did with the fish? Or maybe it's part of the setting, like in setting the sea. So can you also get your children to join in that soundscape with you? If there's a, if there's a fly or a wasp in the story, bzzz, that they join in the sound with you as well. And um, so those are the are three things that you can use with any simple story that you might have or any favorite story or a new story. Just pick out two or three words, a particular phrase that you think is really important to it that you can repeat and also create a bit of setting by using your voice in an abstract way and to create that kind of soundscape. Yeah. So like last week, I set a little bit of a task and uh, these tasks are, they're not um, mandatory, but these are good tasks to do to help you get the most out of storytelling and to build your confidence up with using some of these techniques one stage at a time. So if you want to embark on the homework this time, then the little homework task is the first one is to just talk to your child. And if they had a golden ring, what might they wish for, do you think? And I'm quite sure that what they might wish for might change from day to day. But it's nice to just check in with them and find out what it is that they would wish for if they had that chance. And maybe instead of telling you what it is that they wished for, can they act it out or can they mime it to you? Can they show you what it is that would be their wish? And can you guess what that is? So that's one task that you can do. And the second one relates to those points that I just made as to how you can um, replace gesture for word. So can you find an another story that has a wish in it? 
whatever that might be. And I know there's Aladdin's lab, but there are so many stories that have a wish as part of that story. So can you find another story that has a wish in it? And can you replace two or three of the words in that story with a physical gesture instead and see what impact that has on your child or your children when you're sharing the story with them. So those are the tasks for this week. Um, I just thought I'd say a couple of things just about the um, notes at the end of the handout. I've put some links on there for the storytelling links. There are some links that, are, there's a link to our website, for example, which has some family resources that you might want to access, some activity packs that have some other ideas. They don't specifically link into the stories that um, I'm sharing as part of these webinars, but they have activities that relate to other themes that might link into a story that you're reading for them. So there are themes like space or food or bridges or building things. Um, so you can just check those out and see if there's anything of interest for you there. But I've also got links that some um, child development links on why storytelling is important for young children. And also um, a little bit about um, a study on gesture and the importance of that for language acquisition, just to um, kind of reinforce a little what I was saying there. Um, and finally, I've got a link. I'll always, every week, have a different link of online theatre shows for young children that I think are really great quality. And some of them ask for donations, but all of them have free access. So if you want to um, share some of those links or explore them with your child, there's some really wonderful um, theatre and, and story experiences that you can access and share because so many theatres here in the UK are still closed and so certain amount of their content some of them have put online that you can access so there's a few links there for you to be able to access some of the some of the quality theatre that gets that gets made here for young children and that's today's theme but just to say the next session we're going to be focusing on visual and sensory aids to stories and you might have seen a little bit of that in the fisherman and the ring where i used the, the slipper um, as part of the boat but we'll ex be exploring that in more detail next week so if you'd like to join me next week we'll be looking at another story this time from poland and we'll be looking at visual and sensory aids and how they can enhance stories in your home but for now have you got any questions for me so if you have any questions about the story or about any of the tasks that you tried to do last week um, any discoveries or any issues please put them in the chat box or in the q a and i'll do my best to answer them so i'll give you a little bit of chance to have a think of any questions or any questions about this session any more questions specifically about about language um, and whilst you're thinking of questions for me there or typing them into the chat box um, here are just a couple of questions that um, parents have have asked me in the past um, and that I found um, some useful thoughts on so one question that I get asked quite often by parents is about language delays and um, sometimes parents get worried that maybe their child isn't um, vocalising or isn't as, as clear or isn't using language particularly and they don't seem to be as advanced in their language use as um, some of their other peers. Um, and just to say that all children, their stage of development is very different and some will be focused more on physical development, others might be focused more on language, but especially if you're in a culture in which you're learning more than one language at a time, if you have multiple languages in your home or in their nursery or education environment, then there's a whole range of different languages that are going to, 
to filter through and it's perfectly natural for a child that's experiencing um, more than one language to have a language delay and that's perfectly natural. Um, also, um, it's absolutely fantastic when they start using language, different languages and putting them in the same sentence. Um, I know many children do this and it doesn't matter that they're mixing languages up from different, um, different languages and putting them together in, in one sentence. They will be able to compartmentalize it and separate them out later and it's part of their experimentation. So don't feel, oh no, I must have my child speaking purely in French or only in English or um, it's absolutely fine that they mix languages within, within sentences. Um, so that's one question I often get asked. Have we any other questions, perhaps on today's session? Well, whilst we wait and see if any more questions come up, a second um, question is, my child wants the same story all the time and they don't want to hear a new one. Um, what can I do? So this often happens, sometimes it can be with stories, sometimes it can be with clothes, that there's a particular outfit that they like and they get stuck on and they don't want to wear anything else. They just want to wear that same outfit day in, day out. And it can be the same with stories as well, that they want to hear the same story. There's Sometimes there is so much happening in their development that they need the familiarity, the safety of that routine, of that familiarity to be able to hear those same stories told in the same way with the same voices that you do. Um, and they love to anticipate the familiarity of that. So I think if that's the situation, I think it's important to kind of respect where they're at keep repeating the story, but maybe one way is to say, well, we've had this story for quite a few days now. Maybe we could have this story and another story. And you can start to introduce another story in and then maybe finish off with the familiar story afterwards. Or perhaps you can suggest that you just do part of the familiar story and then try a new one. And Stories like all things, some children prefer some kinds of stories and others prefer others. So it's finding, I think I said this a bit last week, it's finding what kind of stories that excite your children as part of that too. But always giving the option to try a new one and you will find that eventually they will want something new, that something new becomes really quite an exciting offer, especially if if you maybe build up a little bit of um, uh, a few clues about what might be in that story. So a few, ooh, there's a story about, about treasure. Mm. I don't know what kind of treasure because I've not read the story, but I know there's some treasure in the story. So you can maybe tease them a little with some details so that they actually might want to find out then what might be in that new story. So that's another question that I get asked quite often. Um, are there any other questions, perhaps about language or even about gesture? I know in many cultures, hand gestures are a huge part of that culture. Um, and often um, there are, I don't know if, if you have uh, baby signing classes there where you can encourage children to use signs before they have that language to be able to express what they want, um, but which is absolutely, you know, fantastic. Um, in the UK, we're not so good at using hand gestures, unfortunately. We have this reserve, so we're not so good at using those hand gestures that are in so many other languages that are part and parcel of speaking. And when you're using that gesture, just be careful to be really clear with what is precisely that gesture and not perhaps all the other hand gestures that, that might go with it. So it's just trying to be really clear with what that gesture might be and um, so that they can 
pick that out from all the other hand gestures um, that are part of your repertoire. Um, and yeah, just, um, just to say that I think signs, hand gestures, that kind of expression is hugely positive. The more ways that you can give context to language through the story meaning, through gestural meaning, through visual aids, then the more that word becomes meaningful to them and the more that they will use it as part of developing their vocabulary. So I shall see if we have no, there are no last questions. So I'm hoping that means that I've covered the ground for you there. Um, so like I said, next week we'll be having a story from Poland, the Dragon of Krakow, and we'll be focusing on some of those visual aids that you can use to help enhance your stories at home. But this week, give that task a go. See if you can replace two or three of the words from your story with a gesture, with a physical gesture, um, and see how that draws your children in. Thank you.